The Ocean Sunfishes, a beautiful name, bringing to mind vast sunlit seas and gleaming golden fish. But in reality, the ocean sunfishes are a little different. So tell me about sunfish. Well, where do I start? The ocean sunfish are a really strange group of fishes. They're true oceanic oddballs. They look like giant dinner plates with wings or, or a huge swimming head. And yet they do have an important ecosystem role. They, they can travel huge distances. They can dive really deep. And of course, like many fish in our seas, they're facing huge challenges right now from climate change and fisheries impacts, just to name a couple. And yet they're mainly famous for their goofball expression. Uh, they've even gone viral on the internet and even received some abuse online just for existing. My name is Tasha Phillips. I'm a marine biologist and a chance opportunity led me to study ocean sunfish. And from the first glance, I was literally hooked. That strange shape, where do they live? How do they eat? How do they swim? I had to know more. Fortunately, over the years, I worked with some amazing people from across the world. So join me as we set out on a wild fish chase to explore and understand the ocean sunfishes. I'm standing off on the west coast of the USA, speaking to the queen of sunfishes, the ocean sunfish expert who literally wrote the book on them, Dr. Tierney Tees. So for anyone who hasn't seen a sunfish yet, how would you describe an ocean sunfish? Well, they are, um, <laughs> they're essentially just a big swimming head and they look like they'd be a clumsy fish, but when you see them underwater, they're just incredibly graceful. So they have lots of secrets, talents. <laughs> so speaking of secrets, the first mystery about the ocean sunfish is its strange shape. Can you explain why they look like this? Well, they come from a group of coral reef fishes that um, I always say were built for comfort, not for speed, like the puffer fish and the porcupine fish who are in the same order, the tetraodoniform order, which is all the funny shaped fish. And that's their ancestry. So when you've got that and you decide that one faction's going to head off into the open ocean, well, it's pretty hard to divorce yourself from your bloodline. And no matter how much you work out, you're never going to be a tuna. <laughs> so that's, um, that's what they evolutionarily came from and have done really quite well. Yes, I suppose we don't really think about them as specialist puffer fishes honed for open water adventures. But as you say, despite having evolved over millions of years to fit this specialist niche, but they now seem to be in some danger. Can I ask you about your concerns for the ocean sunfishes? Well, I think like any fish in the ocean, it's a difficult environment to be in. We have um, industrial scale fishing operations. We have pollutants. We have a warming ocean. And all these, all these death by a thousand cuts are affecting life in the oceans. Yes. And so with some of those challenges in mind, can I ask you, why should we care for the ocean sunfishes? In some areas where we have pulled out the food fish, the jellies have moved in and are creating problems once they get a, a tentacle hold. So having jelly eaters come in, like the sunfish, the big sunfish, is a really important part of preserving the resilience of the marine food chain. That sounds fantastic. And I agree, they are a critical part of marine ecosystems. And I love people who get interested in the sunfish because they come into it through pure, unadulterated curiosity. It's not fear, like sharks inspire these toothy predators. You're like, they're so terrifying. It's not that. It's this more, wow, what's going on there? It's really pure curiosity. <laughs> I love that. Maybe the sunfish still represent some of the mysteries we found in our oceans. Thanks so much for your time, Tierney. Chatting with Tierney highlighted some of the wonders of the sunfishes, but also some growing concerns. To find out more about the impact of differing fisheries, we're heading south to Peru to speak with Dr. Joanna Alfaro. So can you tell me about some of the fisheries you work with and the sunfish species you see in Peruvian waters? We work with 
a lot with uh, this interface between small scale fisheries and marine uh, megafauna. We thought it was just mola mola, but talking to people and seeing the pictures, um, we identified also the Vasturus, Lanzolatus, the Rancenia levis, and also from the pictures uh, recently, uh, we know that there is mola tecta also. So, so far it's four species, but I think if we dig some more, we will find some more. That's fantastic. It sounds like one of the few places in the world where you get nearly all five sunfish species in one place. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, who doesn't love sunfish? I mean, they're amazing animals. Can I ask about your research on fisheries? I mean, we all know that large scale fisheries can have an impact on local species populations, but what about the small scale artisan fisheries? Do they have an impact too? Uh, that's a hard question. We estimated that only in, in a fishery, in the Central North fishery, there is about 300 molas caught in a year uh, for that small fleet. But if you extrapolate that, 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 that becomes thousands of molas. It's, it's uh, something to, to worry about. And about the sunfish that are caught, are they just accidental bycatch or is there a market for them locally? When we were asking fishermen, what do you do with it? Could you eat it? And and some of them report that they have tried to eat it, but the flesh is not very attractive. That it looks gelatinous, and it has a lot of parasites. So that, in a way, keep them off from eating the, the <laughs> sunfishes. <laughs> oh, that's good news for the sunfish, at least. Yeah, it is good for a sunfish, um, but that things can change. There's few initiatives in the country to work on sustainable fisheries, but one of the main things we we still struggle with is how to report bycatch. This species is not reported to Peru, and that's how it started in our minds, and then started networking with people. That is that has been key for us. Like for example, um, when we read your poster in the in the meeting in Exeter, and we grab a little paper with your contacts. Uh, and then reach out and we have to improve that. You know, it's um, it's important that we establish this relationship. Yeah, I think you're right. The most important thing is that, that we work together on these, these global problems. We're all facing the same things. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very thank much you for your time. time. It's interesting to hear from Joanna that although small scale artisan fisheries only take a small number of sunfishes by catch, one may appreciate the scale of the artisan fisheries as a fleet in itself, it can still be of conservation concern. To explore more about the challenges of studying fish, we're heading further on our journey, soaring over to New Zealand to speak with Dr. Mayana Nugar about her incredible discovery of a new sunfish species that's been hiding in plain sight. So studying sunfish is always a challenge. And then it turned out that there are more species than anyone ever expected. Can you share with us how you discovered a new species? Well, when I was doing my PhD in Indonesia, I was interested in knowing whether the Indonesian sunfish were connected to the Australian ones. And so I got the Australian fisheries to sample skin samples for me. And on a whim, I asked New Zealand to do the same. And that was really fortuitous because amongst those samples from New Zealand was a species that was undescribed. I wasn't the first to detect this. Some Japanese researchers had detected this earlier um, and my data pointed in the same direction. So the big challenge really then was to find this fish because I didn't really know how it looked like. So the undescribed species turned out to be smaller. We think that it probably doesn't get to much more than 2.4, 2.5 meters maybe. But it's still a big fish and I was very lucky that people were super supportive and would contact me from New Zealand when there was a stranding so I could take a genetic sample to confirm it really was the one we were looking for and then also get morphological data to, so that we could describe it. And another thing that turned out to be really useful was the uh, museum collection and they actually had a number of this species and because at the time there was confusion about how each species looked like. In the end, we named it Mola Tecta from the Latin Tectus, which means a hidden or disguised. 
And of course, from there came its English name, Hoodwinker, uh, because it was just been hoodwinking everyone. Fascinating. So you've also done photo identification work of some fishes whilst diving. Can you explain to me how this works? So the way that it works is that divers send us uh, photos of sunfish and the species there is Mola alexandrini or giant sunfish. And so you have to imagine these massive fish like a food truck full of parasites. They come into the reefs and here are all of these hungry cleaner fish just waiting to clean. So during this time, you can actually as a diver come fairly close to them. If you're really calm and you don't disturb the cleaner fish, you can come close and observe this phenomenon. When you dive with them, it's really good to keep this in mind. They are busy getting cleaned and they need their space. So as a diver, you just need to stay calm and stay at a distance. So what we do when we receive all of these photos, uh, we then uh, catalog them and scrutinize the metadata, basically when and where were these pictures taken and then start the process of comparing them with the catalog. Exactly the same principle as numerous other species, including manta rays and whale sharks and zebras. So sunfish, the species Mola alexandrini is excellent for this because they've got incredible body patterns they're so intricate and they are each so so individual and there are some matches with with some years in between so even though we don't know where the sunfish go after the end of the season we don't have enough data to say whether they come back each season but we can definitely say that they do return to the same spot that's fascinating and do you enjoy diving with the sunfish are they quite skittish to dive with well, they're super fun. They're my favorite animal, of course. Uh, and th there are various reasons why these are really fun to dive with. One is just because they're so strange looking and it is like looking at an underwater alien. The brave ones will come and check you out. And there are certainly also skittish ones that just by the mere sight of a diver will fly off the reef. Uh, as if they know that you can't possibly keep up because they are super fast. But yeah, beautiful animals to dive with. Thanks so much, Mona. Thanks. It's amazing to hear from Mayana that even now, when we think we know our oceans, that new giant species like Mola tecta can still appear right in front of our eyes. We still have so much more to learn, even as we dive amongst them. To learn more about the secrets of the sunfishes, our journey continues to Japan to explore the challenges of identifying the five differing ocean sunfish species from Dr. Edsuro Sawai. Sunfishes belong to the order Tetraodontiformes and is closely related to porcupine fishes and puffer fishes. Currently, the molidae is genetically and morphologically accepted to consist of three genera and five species. The standard English names and scientific names of the five varied species are as shown. All of the five species are similar in morphology at first glance, which has led to species confusion and misidentification around the world. For example, the image photo of Moramora on the IUCN red list mistakenly used a photo of Mora Alexandrini. Some individuals are different to identify two species level due to individual variation. However, adult fish can generally be identified to species level by the taxonomic characters shown here. Additionally, the body scales around the pectoral fin are useful as a taxonomic character for the three more species which are particularly easily confused. However, taxonomic characters become clearer with age. Small individuals of genius Mora are very similar in morphology and should be carefully examined for morphology. In particular, the morphology of the larval and juvenile stages of genius Mora needs to be investigated in conjunction with DNA analysis. 
from the past to the present, including the current five species. The scientific names of 56 nominal species have been proposed for modern Morigi. Thank you for watching. After hearing about Ed Suro's painstaking research to understand the differing sunfish species, I wanted to learn more about potential threats across the world. Alongside fisheries bycatch, sunfish are also targeted for human consumption across several regions. So, can you tell me a bit about the sunfish target fisheries? Sunfish are often caught as bycatch worldwide. However, in some Asian countries, they are caught as a targeted species, like in Taiwan or Japan. In eastern Taiwan, um, people are often use it as food. And in Asia country, the annual landing can reach up to 100 tons. Especially in Taiwan, they can reach up to 900 tons per year. So far, there's no species-specific conservation approach for sunfish. However, we do have some marine protected area for sizing of sunfish, like in Galapagos Island and Indonesia. That's really interesting. And can we ask your thoughts about the future for sunfish and conservation? I think sunfish is a very special animal with an extremely large um, body size. However, a lot of their life history characteristics of sunfish are still unknown, like their longevity, natural growth rate, or the age at maturity. So I think it is important to um, study about their ecological information, and they can provide us the enough data to make um, their conservation policy and take an action to maintain their population. Thanks so much. Thank you. So can I ask you, why did you find parasites so fascinating to study? And how many parasites can one sunfish have? Parasitic communities are integral elements within marine food webs, helping to maintain its equilibrium, integrity, and stability. They can offer us information about host feeding behavior, host ecology, phylogeny, and so on. The family Molide includes some of the most uh, heavily parasitized fish worldwide. And due to my experience, in one specimen with uh, more than two meters length, more than 10,000 parasites were collected only from its digestive system. Oh, <laughs> that's horrible and incredible. How many different species of parasites can some fish have? Uh, to date, uh, we know that they can have more than 70 different species, including protists, trematodes, monogenians, copepods, cestodes, and so on. And does this harm the fish, or can they cope with that extra burden? There is a lack of information about the pathology of the parasites, so we need to know if they can be affecting organs as vital as liver, uh, kidney, gills. More research is needed to try to understand if uh, parasites are affecting the buoyancy, the growth of the fish, uh, locomotion, or its survival. It sounds like a, a living mini ecosystem just on one fish. This is an absolutely true affirmation. Uh, they're like floating islands with large parasitic loads uh, of different parasitic species living in, in all their organs. Well, the fact is that the molids are a dream for parasitology teachers. That's fascinating. A, a real insight into the world of parasites. Thanks so much. So could you describe the traditional fishery in Suta? How does it work? 
the fishing in Ceuta is very small, around seven boats, and uh, here the most of fishermen work in the Almadraba. The Almadraba is like a big net. Uh, the non-commercial species, like the sun fishes, are free at the end. Uh, the fishermen simply have to pass the fish over the net, and the fish is back into the sea. That sounds really environmentally friendly, that's amazing. And recently you helped to release that really large fish from the nets that went viral. Can you tell me what happened? Yes, uh, this day we was something with some colleagues, uh, a scuba diver from the Almadraba who worked with us, on me uh, to warn about the special selfish. So we go to the Almadraba quickly to see and to take the sample. That looks amazing. How big was it? How much did it weigh? The total length from the mouth uh, to the end of the flywood to uh, 2.9 meters. And the total body uh, uh, deep, a uh, linear length between anal fin tip and the dorsal fin tip, uh, 3.2 meters. And uh, we could not weigh the individual was a pity because our weight measured up to 1,000 kilos. So it was more than a thousand kilos. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And you must have been delighted to get an animal of that size safely back into the sea. It must be hard to release fish at that size. Well, 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 yes. of course, the fishermen have a lot of experience and the some fish process the net into about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm very stressed because it's very big and very dangerous with the boat and there are a lot of people all pass very quickly and I was lucky to swim with, the, with it. Amazing. It sounds like it worked out really well both for the fishers and for the fish. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So why are there these concerns that some fish contain dangerous toxins? Ocean sand fish belong to the order Tetrodontiformes, which also includes puffer fish. Puffer fish are famous for being associated with food poisoning, paralysis, and even death. And this happens because most puffer fish species contain tetrodotoxin or polytoxin, which are powerful neurotoxins. As a direct result of the close phylogenetic relationship between ocean sand fish and puffer fish, it is sometimes assumed that oceans and fish may also contain biotoxin. And what have you found in your research so far? Do the sunfish contain these? So far, three studies were performed evaluating the presence of tetrodotoxin in ocean sand fish. In these studies, ocean sand fish were examined, no tetrodotoxin or its derivatives were found in the muscle or liver of molar specimens or in the muscle of Masturus lanceolatus and Rezania levis specimens. However, in one of those studies, a hemolytic assay suggested the presence of polytoxin-like compounds in the muscle of one Masturus lanceolatus specimen from East Asia. In this way, while scientific evidence suggests that ocean sand fish do not contain tetrodotoxin, further research should be conducted to evaluate the presence of polytoxin in these fish. And you also study microplastics in the oceans. Have you found these in some fish too? Is that something we should be concerned about? Yeah. Microplastics have been reported throughout the marine environment, from the sea surface to the deep sea, in coastal sediments and marine organisms, such as ocean sunfish. To better understand microplastic contamination in ocean sunfish, my colleagues and I examined the stomach contents of ocean sunfish. Microplastics were found in almost 80% of these fish. As such, there is cause for concern. But it's clearly something we all should be more aware of. Thank you so much for sharing your research. Thank you. Thank you. So how do you track fish in the open ocean? 
So there are many, many new technologies nowadays, but I'm going to talk what I've used from a PhD. We used a smart position only, which is a spot tab that is attached to the sunfish fin. And every time the fish is at surface, it sends its position to the Argo satellites. So we can access these almost near real time. Then we also used uh, PSATs, which has pop-up uh, satellite tags that are attached to the body of the fish and record temperature, depth, and light levels at every second. And then after a predetermined time, they release themselves, float to the surface, and then send summaries of this data. And with the light level, we can then triangulate and geolocate the sunfish positions. And then the last one is a fast talk GPS, which is basically a PSAT, but they also have the capacity of whatever at the surface, they can capture and calculate the GPS uh, constellation. So together with the depth, temperature and um, light levels, we have these much refined, higher resolution GPS positions of where the sunfish was having. So yeah, those are the three different tags that we, I've used for my PhD. No, I think it's fantastic. And it's really interesting to hear that there are all of these differences between you. There are, there are massive differences. So what were your key findings? How far can some fish travel? So yes, they do travel quite a long way. They do have these long distance movers. I think the longest we had for the Northeast Atlantic, something like I think over 3000 kilometers, there and back almost. So I think it was 750 kilometers away from the tagging location. But I know, for instance, that sunfish in Japan, one of them did displace over 2,000 kilometers as well. So they do have this very long distance um, and they do travel quite far. But I think the, the key findings from my study and also globally, because this is not unique for the Northeast Atlantic, was that the sunfish do display these um, seasonal north-south movements. So when we tagged sunfish in the beginning of spring, they all started to move north along with the warming of the temperatures and also probably following the blooming of the productivity known for the North Atlantic in, for, for, for that season. And then at the end of summer, beginning of autumn, they all started to move south again. So this, this north-south seasonal um, movements were also seen uh, for the Northwest Atlantic and also in Japan. So these are um, seems to be happening everywhere, basically tracking along with the warming of the temperature and also productivity, obviously. And so can we call these movements migrations? I think at the best, actual migrations, because not all the population moves. That's for sure. That was the other thing that we saw is that some of the sunfish, they didn't move anywhere. They just that we did see that the majority of the, the larger individuals that we tagged, they did move, they did displace embark in these long travels. But the small ones tend to, to stay behind. But also, one of our immature individuals did travel quite a long far. They, I think it did over 500 kilometers. So it can't really be maturation that is dragging these, okay, I, off I go or not. But I don't think it's not real migrations. At the very best, I think it's partial, partial migration. That's not all the population moves. I think that's really fascinating. So it sounds like there's a lot more yet to understand and discover. There is, definitely there is. And you know very well, Natasha, it's like it's a whole world to, to be found still. Thanks so much. It's really fascinating. So when we've worked together in the past, dissecting dead sunfish that had been donated after they stranded, we found some really strange things, including that thick white layer beneath the surface, the, the capsule, the hypodermis. I was hoping you could describe a bit more about that, uh, what it is and, and how it works. Well, it is uh, really odd from a fish point of view because there's this layer of rubbery, semi-rigid material, um, which is uh, quite unlike that of almost all other fish uh, and that's one of the things that got us excited what does this layer do we knew that the material itself uh, was actually uh, lighter than seawater uh, it gives a sort of life jacket to the fish which means that it, it doesn't sink uh, so it can hover in mid-water without any problems but during our dissection we found out that it had lots of other uh, functions as well 
I think that's just fascinating. And alongside that it functions most likely as a, a life jacket, there were two other elements we discovered. Would you describe those for me? Uh, first of all, the uh, sunfish has two sorts of muscles. Uh, most of its muscles are um, white muscles, which are anaerobic, uh, but they do have some red muscles, uh, which are well supplied with blood, and they may uh, keep warm when the um, sunfish is diving into cold water. It probably works like um, a wetsuit to keep any heat in. The other thing uh, is that the um, material, the capsule, uh, works uh, as uh, a sort of exoskeleton. Now we're used to the idea that uh, a fish uh, has um, an endoskeleton. You've only got to eat a mackerel to know how many bones you have in the, the internal skeleton of the fish. But what happens with the uh, sunfish is that the capsule functions, first of all, to give a sort of rigidity to the fish. And that actually helps it swim quite quickly because rigid bodies move through water much more readily than one that's undulating, creating a lot of drag. Also, several of the muscles have attachments uh, to this exoskeleton and help to drive the two big fins which move the sunfish along at uh, relatively high speeds. So it's uh, a life jacket, it's a wetsuit, uh, and it's a skeleton. That's incredible. And it's all hidden just out of sight. More secrets of the sunfish to be sure. Thanks so much, John. So you run an organization that really rescues a lot of animals and prevents many tragedies. And so can I ask you, why do sunfish strand? You know, Wellfleet Harbor is where we have most of our strandings on the Cape. It's a very deep harbor in the mouth. It's a very long harbor, four and a half miles. It actually leads the animals into the inner harbor, which is a very dangerous, shallow water, treacherous area. And as they move four and a half miles into the harbor and they get into the inner harbor, they're stuck. The tide goes out, there they are, high and dry. So it's a healthy fish in the wrong place at the wrong time. That sounds like a, a huge challenge. And, and how big are the sunfish that you usually deal with? Some of the smallest ones have been under 100 pounds, which would be really great to rescue if they were all that size. And some of the biggest ones have been probably over 1,500 pounds. And we think that we're dealing with mainly juveniles that are up in Cape Cod Bay, maybe waters north, having fun, eating in the summer and the fall, lots of jellyfish, having a great time. As the waters get colder, they realize that they need to head south. They are trapped like many other animals that we deal with in this, the fall and the early winter. Sea turtles get trapped, ocean sunfish, torpedo rays, seabirds get trapped uh, in the arm of the Cape. And eventually, if they can't figure out how to get out, they will strand. That just sounds so difficult. And so when a sunfish strands on the beach and, and you get the call, what happens next? Well, as you know, with any stranding, immediacy is really important. So the faster you can get somebody down to that animal, the more successful you're going to be. And so we train volunteer community members. They don't have to be marine biologists. We don't care. We just want people who are, you know, eager, passionate, willing to get involved. And they're going to be able to get there as I'm driving down, try to stabilize the situation or get the animal back into deeper water. That sounds fantastic to have such a rapid response team. So how do you shift the really big animals? Well, since we're all volunteer, we're, you know, going on the cheap. And so what we do is we find that as long as the ocean sunfish is in even a couple inches of water, we can move a big animal easy. And you kind of just want to use physics as your friend. We have kayakers who are our first responders and they'll jump in the water, they'll put the animal on a strap and then get the animal in a hula hoop. And this is just a hula hoop I found at the thrift store. 
the mouth of the ocean sunfish is still under the water and this fish can pump water over its gills. So the first responders then attach the hula hoop with the sunfish behind their kayak and they kayak the ocean sunfish out of the marsh, around the pier, out of the shallow water and release way back out into Cape Cod Bay and then out around the Cape to continue their migration south to warmer wintering areas. That sounds amazing. What a wonderful network of people rescuing, what, hundreds, maybe thousands of animals. That's really inspirational, the work that you do. I, I hope you know that. And it's fun. And you meet, you meet such great people like you and just the general public. I mean, everyone is so curious and quite often everyone is willing to roll up their sleeves and jump in the water and help out where they can. And it really does give you faith in humanity that, you know, even though we're tackling some really big problems right now, like climate change and marine debris and all that stuff, that there are people who are willing to help out. It's going to be a concerted effort of organizations all working together, sharing what they know and, and what they've learned that's really going to save this planet. It just shows how one person can make a positive difference, bringing together hearts and minds. I think that's the positive news we all need to hear right now. Thank you. So we've been right around the world on a, a wild fish chase and it's been a fascinating journey. Even after years of studying these fish, there's still so much more to learn. The sunfish hide many mysteries and although they still face many challenges, I still have hope for, for the future of sunfishes, particularly now that there seems such a global network of passionate people firmly on their side.